Hello, everyone. Welcome to Things We Said Today, a Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles together in solo and uh, things Beatle related as well. I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD too. And uh, you can listen on our website, WFUV.org. And we have an app you can download and listen there. I've been at WFUV uh, for several hundred years now. Uh, You could catch me Monday through Thursday nights at 10 p.m. and Saturday afternoons at one. And I am joined by my good friends and co-hosts, the one and only Ken Michaels. You know him from his radio show, um, Every Little Thing, a syndicated radio show. And also he's one of the hosts of the video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Ken has been uh, in broadcasting now almost 40 years, most of that time. Uh, it's involved Beatles bro- broad, uh, programming, Beatles broadcasting. Uh, mm-hmm. Spent a little time at Sirius XM uh, back before the day when they were just XM satellite radio. So a big hello to to Ken Michaels. How are you, Ken? Good, Darren. Recovering then- from from our our last uh, show, <laughs> and uh, what an amazing time that was. But we'll talk about that more. Yeah. Absolutely. And also Alan Coe's in the acclaimed writer, journalist, and music critic. Alan's been uh, writing professionally for well, close to 40 years as well. Um, you've More probably than. read his work through the years <laughs> of the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Um, he's written several books uh, regarding the Beatles, the Beatles from the cavern to the rooftop, uh, and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. And um, some other books as well uh, on classical music and whatnot. And I would like to say hello to my friend, Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? Hello, Darren. Just fine. And hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. Hey, Alan. It seems like we were just here doing this and we had some company. Mm. Uh, We we are coming off uh, the high of highs when it comes to Beatles podcast world. Uh, um, uh, and I want to thank all of you who uh, spent some time, maybe watched all of it, uh, listened to all of it, or checked it out in sections. Our last show, we were honored with the great Peter Jackson, the director of The Beatles Get Back, and he was so graciously gave us his time. Uh, and that was our last show, uh, which uh, went up, um, what was it, like Thursday? No, Thursday was Thanksgiving, the day before, right? Wednesday? Mm-hmm. Uh, last Wednesday, in anticipation of uh, the screening of The Beatles Get Back. And we've been talking about this for so long, it is hard to believe that it is now behind us. We've all seen it. And today on uh, Things We Said Today, we'll uh, do a little recap, not only on the movie, but our interview with Peter Jackson as well, which you can still watch or listen to if you haven't done so yet. It's sitting there in podcast land. But before we move on and talk about the movie itself, uh, Ken's got the news. All right, thank you, Darren. And actually, this this will be one of my shortest newscasts. Uh, Starting with uh, Paul McCartney uh, being nominated for two Grammy Awards for the upcoming ceremonies taking place uh, at the Crypto.com Arena in Los Angeles on January 31st. Paul is being nominated for Best Rock Song with Find My Way, which ironically, don't know if you know about this, the song is competing with the song All My Favorite Songs by Weezer, which is partly written by Ilze Juber, who happens to be the daughter of Lawrence and Hope Juber. So, Got a a former wing (laughs) and uh, his daughter co-writing that song, competing with Paul's song right there for rock song, best rock song of the year. Also, Paul is nominated for best rock album for McCartney three. In the composing arranging category, a new orchestral arrangement of Eleanor Rigby by Cody Fry is nominated for best arrangement instruments and vocals. This is an arrangers award. And just in case you're curious, the other albums in the best rock album category are Power Up 
from ACDC. Uh, Capital Cuts, live from Studio A, the Black Pumas. No One Sings Like You Anymore, part one from Chris Cornell. And uh, that whole album is Chris doing a lot of rock covers, including John's Watching the Wheels, Harry Nilsson's Jump Into the Fire, also ELO's Showdown on that particular album, and also Paul's Friends, The Foo Fighters, and Medicine at Midnight. Okay, Rolling Stone is reporting that The Edge and producer Bob Ezrin have assembled a massive guitar collection from the likes of Paul McCartney, Rush, Radiohead, Bruce Springsteen, Ron Wood, Joe Walsh, and others to benefit Music Rising, a charity they started in 2005 to aid musicians that were devastated by Hurricane Katrina. And Paul is donating his Yamaha BB-1200 electric bass guitar that he played in concert during uh, Wings tours of the 70s. Guitar icons, a musical instrument auction to benefit Music Rising will take place December the 11th at Von Easton Galleries in Los Angeles, but bids will also be accepted through the internet. Though I don't have too many details, I think the title of this book says everything. Mike McCartney will have another photo book coming out. It's called Mike McCartney's Early Liverpool Photographs, Prints, and uh, that will be coming out January next year. According to the Daily Mail, unseen photos of the Beatles will be going on exhibit at London's Shapiro Modern Gallery. It's called Lost Photographs of the Beatles. These photos were taken during the spring of 1964 during the shooting of A Hard Day's Night. The negatives remained undeveloped for the last 57 years. They were taken by Lord Christopher Thine, T-H-Y-N-N-E who was invited to the film set for only two days during a period when he was pursuing a more bohemian lifestyle. Tyne passed away in 2017 at the age of 82, and he was the mastermind behind these shots. He'd also been sacked from the family seat in Longleat. This exhibit will run from December 9th through January the 16th. Um, three days ago, November 26th, we lost one of the true giants of songwriters and lyricist and composer Stephen Sondheim, who died at the age of 91. Sondheim gave us great musicals such as West Side Story, Company, Sweeney Todd, Follies, and many others. Paul McCartney once revealed that the Beatles song There's a Place was inspired by the song Somewhere, what some people refer to as There's a Place for Us from West Side Story. Sondheim wrote the lyrics to West Side Story, but Leonard Bernstein wrote the music. I know. That's, okay, but just, I'm just in case saying, anyone is confused about, you know, what Paul was inspired by. I think he saw the sheet music for it. And hmm. just knowing how the words went, that helped to inspire the song, There's a Place. But Paul had some words to say, some nice words on Twitter. Uh, on, on Sondheim. He said, very sad to hear of the passing of the great Stephen Sondheim. I was fortunate to meet him and chat about songwriting. He was a witty, intelligent man. Send in the Clowns is one of my favorite songs. So well-crafted and beautiful with it. We have lost a great talent, but his music will live long and prosper. Goodbye, Stephen. We love you, Paul. All right. You know, um, as a side note, as you mentioned, Leonard Bernstein there, he was a huge supporter of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. He was always raving about them and pointing out specific songs that he thought were brilliant from them and how groundbreaking a lot of their music was. But um, I'm not too familiar if Stephen talked at all about the Beatles. I know Leonard Bernstein did. But anyway, some nice words there from Paul. Finally, we wish a happy 80th birthday to... Pete Best, who turned the big number on November the 24th. Way to go, Pete. Back to you, Darren. All righty. Um, it is very strange to think that after talking about it and anticipating the Peter Jackson film uh, for so long now that it's actually now behind us. I think I said that earlier in the show. But um, The Beatles Get Back was broadcast, if you will, on Disney Plus over the Thanksgiving weekend, Thanksgiving holiday, Thursday, part one, 
Friday, part two became available and a part three dropped on, uh, on Saturday. Um, and the way it worked was that at midnight on the West Coast, uh, they became available for streaming. And that meant 3 a.m. on the East Coast where the three of us are located. Um, and it just seemed as though, and I'm sure the pandemic kind of played into this. First of all, this was probably going to be a different type of movie and a shorter movie had there been no pandemic because it would have been released in 2020. Uh, and the length of uh, the finished product that we saw on Disney Plus uh, was directly or indirectly, depending on how you look at it, the result of Peter Jackson and his team having a heck of a lot more time than he ever thought he was going to have and putting this together. And the result was um, the documentary clocking in, I think it was something like 12 or 13 minutes shy of eight hours. Um, and talk now is if you watched our interview with Peter Jackson on our last show, Peter has alluded to the fact that in all likelihood, we're looking at a Blu-ray release and we are looking at much more material being there, um, bringing the length of, uh, of the movie to, you know, several weeks in length. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> over 10 hours, perhaps. But it did seem very weird that after this long buildup that started with us talking about the 50th anniversary reissues of the Let It Be movie and album, that it turned into this whole different thing, much bigger and grander, uh, and a new film, The Beatles Get Back. The other thing that, that struck me before we talk specifically about the movie uh, was that I picked the year uh, 2003 as a point when the anticipation for the re-release at least of the film started to become something we talked about a lot because 2003 was the year Let It Be Naked came out which was released at, at a time when we were hearing a lot about the reissue of the Let It Be movie um, and they were kind of going to be releases the uh, the movie and the album were going to sort of be companion releases at roughly the same time and we know the movie never happened and let it be naked kind of sat at sits out there now in uh the beatles catalog as an album that didn't quite have its it's a lonely album because it didn't quite have its friend the reissue of the movie fast forward now here we are 2021 and holy smokes was that something else um the beatles get back and for us here and, and for many of our listeners, we want to thank you so much. Uh, the massive cherry on top of all of this was getting to spend time with Peter Jackson and getting to go into his mind, into the making of the movie, the process, talking Beatles, talking logistics, and then watching the movie. So uh, I'm going to throw it to you guys. I have one regret, and that was that I didn't take better notes as I was watching. Um, I thought that this was going to actually work as a pretty good recorder of, uh, of things. But as the hours went by, I realized I should have brought a piece of paper and a pencil with me while I'm watching. Um, but it, it was just, it was surreal. It was fascinating with a capital F. And so let me, uh, let's, let's get your thoughts first. Uh, the way my screen is laid out here, I'll do an eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and all right, we're going to start with Alan. He's mo, uh, and uh, let it rip, Alan. What you think? Um, yeah, I, I I thought it was amazing. Um, I watched it. Uh, I watched each episode twice. Actually, the first one three times. Um, got up at three for each of them and then watch them later um, with uh, my sister was visiting for Thanksgiving. And um, so watch it again, you know, with, with her and uh, my wife. So it was, it was, it was up for both showings. Um, and, uh, you know, actually it's interesting that um, when it was over, uh, one thing my wife said was, you know, I, I, it feels really sort of sad because I feel like we've been sort of living in Beatles world for the last three days. And, and now it's over, you know. Mm. Um, 
And uh, oh, no, it's not. You could go right back to the beginning of part one. That was a comforting thing. I could I relate to what your wife said because I felt like, oh, it's, I can't believe it's over. Wait a minute. Yeah. No, it's not. Yes, well, yeah. But the thing is, um, you know, it's not good. Well, I mean, on one hand, you know, sort of what she's saying is like all of these things that we're seeing, we're sort of seeing for the first time, even if we've heard them, heard them on the Nagras and, you know, but but now when we see them the second time, it'll be the second time. It won't be quite the same as, as living through it the first time. But on the other hand, um, the the two times I watched it, I mean, the second time, uh, there were a number of things that I hadn't caught the first time because they talk fast and, you know, sometimes mm. they talk over each other and there weren't always subtitles, but sometimes, um, and, you know, so there was, there were things to catch, you know, and I think that when I watch it a third time, there'll be even more. Um, I did take notes and it, in fact, this entire pad, <laughs> His notes, and this is from one of the second listenings where he didn't have the pad with me, so I had to get another pad and stick him in. Um, but the, a few things really, really stood out. Um, first of all, um, among the Twickenham sessions, um, that that bit where they do all of the early Lennon and McCartney songs. Um, you know, when those originally came out on bootleg, bootlegs not having a lot in the way of liner notes or credits or anything like that. I mean, I, I didn't really know that a lot of those were Lennon McCartney songs. Um, and, uh, you know, and thought that some of them, like, well, you know, won't you please say goodbye? I mean, those just sound like they were doing a cover of a country tune. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'm not sure when I found out that they were Lennon McCartney songs. It, it wasn't with this showing, but uh, um, probably when the uh, the complete Nagras came out and they talk about it a bit more than, on, you know, on the original bootlegs, they cut out some of the dialogue and you just got the songs um, on the Nagras. They're they're making it clear that these are songs from when they were you know starting out. Um, but there's quite a lot of them. And, and you know, a lot of those are, are things that we had read about in biographies, you know, Hunter Davies, um, some of those others, things like Too Bad About Sorrow and Just Fun. I mean, these are these are titles we all knew, um, not to mention John singing I Lost My Little Girl, which is Paul's first song. Um, yeah, there were other surprises too like there's there's this one i think it's in the in part two might have even been part three lost track uh paul is singing a song that sounds like a vaudeville song and it's about you know a, a pint of grease paint mm -hmm. and you know he's clearly not making it up on the spot it's a it's a a song i've got no idea where that comes from you know whether that's one of the songs they wrote when they were young whether it's something he you know, had done more recently. I, I, I really, I, I, I couldn't place that thing. But, um, okay, so that, that was the first thing. I mean, just to go through some of these pretty quickly. Um, a major, a major turn on in this for me was watching him write Get Back. Or I should say that oh, yeah. really, because <laughs> John and Paul are together and uh, um, even do part of it while George is away. Um, you know, and the first thing we see is in, in the, the Twickenham parts, uh, he's you know, strumming on his bass as if it's a guitar and they're, they're coming up with this idea of get back. And then we see the No Pakistanis version and the Commonwealth, uh, you know, they're trying to do a, a satire about uh, the sort of ultra right nationalist movement um, I think, you know, I, I wish there was a little more dialogue. I don't know if it, I don't remember it existing on the Nagras, but, um, you know, it, it seems pretty clear, a, a clear assumption anyway, that they dropped it because it's sometimes with satire, especially if it's by a group that isn't known for doing satire. I mean, if, if Tom Lehrer was doing this song, everybody would know it was a satire because that's what he does, but they don't do it. So it might have come across as an actual, you know, racist song rather than a satire of racism. Um, and I have a feeling that that might be why it got changed, but they don't talk about it. Um, and then the next, you know, the next part later uh, where, you know, he comes up with uh, Tucson, Arizona. I mean, I've mentioned this on the show a number of times. 
Uh, that, that has always been one of my favorite moments, and it was great to see it. One thing that Peter Jackson said in our interview is that, you know, hearing the Nagras is one thing, seeing it is completely different. And, and he's right. Um, because, for instance, you know, knowing what we know, <laughs> thought we knew about uh, John during the period, I mean, we know that he was doing some heroin and he was into some other things. And he even refers to that uh, obliquely in the film um and we know what he had to say about the sessions which you know he spoke with complete contempt about them and so i had always envisioned hearing the nagras um i had envisioned john like slumping in his chair being either bored or stoned or you know even when he sounded you know like he was more into it like there's you know one point when he's you know saying sing Paul you know even then I mean it, it just seemed like okay he's really not into this he hates this this is what he's always said you see when they get to Apple John is focused he's energetic he's enthusiastic he is leading those sessions you know even even some of the ones that uh are Paul songs you know he's like right on it and uh and seeing that totally changed you know my perception of what was going on um there is the uh bad in pal story with the boy scouts and the uh nearsightedness which i've mentioned a couple of times too it was really yeah. happy to see that that made it into the cut um just because it's so funny you know and uh you know and everyone else in the, you, you see him like his ability to crack everybody up um, hmm. you know at any time um, and then the lunch tape, you know, in, in our Peter Jackson interview, he demonstrated that um, uh, artificial intelligence system, which he is calling Mal, um, that can separate the sounds on a mono recording. Um, I don't know how many of our listeners might have heard the original lunch tape, but it is just restaurant noise or cafeteria noise technically uh you know there's silverware there's plates there's things dropping there's you know being stacked up being moved being, you can barely hear any conversation and yet um in the film peter had lifted all of that stuff away and you hear this incredible conversation between john and paul where you know uh, they're discussing, you know, who was the boss in the Beatles and uh, who, you know, they're feeling, a bit, John's feeling about Paul sort of imposing his arrangements on the rest of them and John being afraid to speak up. And, uh, you know, they're really sort of having it out. I mean, they're not shouting. They're not, you know, really fighting about it. It's just a, a very serious discussion that even if you had the tape, you've never heard because you couldn't um mm. and you know and also there and later on too you see john stick up for george a number of times you know in the in the uh lunch tape um he's saying you know he he's wounded and we didn't uh, you know give him a band-aid we didn't help at all with him we just we just made it a bit deeper and i thought you know that's this is a sort of a, a sensitive side of John that we don't always see. I mean, when the cameras are on, he says, uh, yeah, okay, George is gone, we'll get Clapton, you know? And that seems a little rough, you know? But then in the lunch tape, when nobody is supposed to be hearing this, he's a different, he takes a different stance. And then later on, when they're getting close to the rooftop or whatever they're going to do. Um, he says, you know, I, I want to make sure we get one of George's in the first section here, you know? Um, so you get the feeling that he's looking out for George, you know? Um, so that was, that was one thing that, um, that, that really sort of impressed me in that, that um, I don't remember hearing much before. Um, but the, the other thing is also about, you know, really just John taking charge uh, once they get to Apple, you know, John is a completely different 
figure. Um, you know, even in, in Twickenham, it's not as if he's sitting there slumped over and bored and stoned. I mean, he's participating, he's joking around, they're all joking around. But once they get to Apple, John really takes charge of that session. And, uh, you know, it's incredible. So, uh, you know, I, I learned an immense amount from this. And uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, sort of a, a great glow around these sessions that have always been thought of as being a little more troublesome. Mm. Yeah. And well, there's so many highlights in this film for me but i just want to bounce off of something that alan said about how you thought that john uh was not engaged during these sessions and a lot of that is from watching let it be there's this one uh particular scene in, in let it be where paul's talking to john it's just the two of them and john doesn't say a word and it looks like he couldn't give a damn what paul is saying and you know there's a part of us that might have felt maybe john was like that throughout all these sessions and then we learned it was the exact opposite. But for me, um, without a doubt, the most amazing moment was that conversation that John and Paul had um, in the cafeteria and how revealing it was. And this movie I look at as being a real character study of each of the four Beatles. And it's so fascinating to watch how from the very beginning, Paul, this was more Paul's idea and Michael Lindsay Hogg, who was so gung ho about them doing a concert in some exotic location. And that seemed to be the most important thing on his mind, really, that and the TV show. But, um, you know, in the very beginning, Paul is, is really pushing the band and making suggestions to the songs, even Don't Let Me Down, which wasn't his song in the first place. You know, and you could see how John and George could be annoyed about that. But at the same time, those of us who have studied this period know that, you know, Paul was always pushing the band because perhaps he was afraid that if he didn't do that, then the others would lose interest and the group would break up. You know, I've made this, this comment on a few of my recent shows that I really do think that deep down, I mean, that they just finished the White Album. They didn't have to do anything for a while. But I think... Paul was probably feeling that unless there was one project after another, that maybe, you know, if you're away from each other, the interest level would drop. John was infatuated with Yoko at that time. He wanted to do more with her. You know, George is away with Bob Dylan, you know, um, and Ringo was about to, to be in The Magic Christian, although that wasn't his first film. But, um, you know, they were off doing different things. So from the very beginning of these sessions, Paul was leading the charge there, trying to get everybody excited about it. And they weren't that excited, partly because of the situation at Twickenham. They weren't happy with the sound there um, at Twickenham. They didn't have a mixing board at all. They had to rely on their amps. They were also there in the morning. Most musicians don't like waking up in the morning. They were pretty uh, you know, unhappy during Twickenham. But he also, very fascinatingly, if that's a word, uh, admitted that he didn't like being the boss. He was very uncomfortable. And they even talk about this ever since Mr. Epstein died, you know, um, that they were without direction. But Paul didn't want to have to keep pushing and being the leader. He felt uncomfortable being that. Well, you certainly saw that once they moved to Apple. And John took char charge and Paul was much happier in that situation. And you could see uh, John and George, you know, it's being so much happier once they went to Apple for many reasons. And also once they had that conversation, John and Paul in the cafeteria and John is telling him straight, you know, you're not considering George's feelings here. George is making suggestions to songs and, they're both not paying that much attention to what George is saying. George is feeling really left out of it. There's one particular scene that I found really interesting, which is when they're doing, she came in through the bathroom window and John and Paul are standing up and they're only a few feet next to each other, looking right at each other. And they're so into the song and each other at that moment, feeding off each other. And George is on the sideline there. And it's kind of like, 
if I was him, I'd be thinking, you know, they're in their own world, John and Paul. Like, who am I? And um, all this, this tension was building. I think it was really clever, genius of Peter Jackson. This kind of plays out like a soap opera because right at the end of the first part, that's when George quits. Dumb. <laughs> and it's this, it's a dark moment. It's like a cliffhanger. What's going to happen? And then you go into part two. You see that look on Paul's face. Like the world's about to end. This band's about to break up. John hasn't shown up to the session. Is John going to show up? George, they still have a problem with. They can't even reach John. Yeah. Which was interesting. Not even answering the phone. Mm-hmm. And Paul says, and then there were two. Yeah, that was. And that, <laughs> that look in his eyes, Ben, what he must have been thinking. I mean, my heart was sinking at that mm-hmm. moment, feeling for Paul. But anyway, once, once Paul listened to what John was saying in that, at that meeting that they had, you can see in the film footage how much George is, is making comments and suggestions about the songs, and Paul is listening, and John is listening, and they're so much happier. And there's even a moment when, um, when they're starting to do Old Brown Shoe and the band is cooking and they're loving it. And Paul is bouncing up and down for George's song and going over to the drums and playing the drums. They're really into George's song and, and you feel so happy for George. And even though most of the songs are all John and Paul songs, even George is still happy with that at that moment because he was given respect, Getting which good. he wasn't given respect in at Twickenham. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very... You study Beatle history and you see how George is flourishing as a songwriter, getting better and better. And he's still this guy that gets a couple of songs per album, no matter what. And that situation did change. Even in Abbey Road, it didn't change. The album Abbey Road. So, um, you know, there's so many amazing moments throughout this whole thing. But I also felt sorry for Ringo because, you know, most of the time he didn't say anything. You're watching him behind the band, observing the band, seeing the problems within the band. And yet no matter what, he's rock salad behind the drums, giving them his support. He's always the easygoing guy in the group. And, uh, you know, but sometimes the look on his face tells all Mm -hmm. with Ringo. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it was fascinating to see how John, like you said, Alan, it was so focused once they went to Apple. They were a completely different band. And once they brought Billy Preston in, oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> he knew all the right notes to play instantly. He, he, he couldn't even, you couldn't have a better fit with this band than having Billy Preston at that moment. Um, you know, if you want me to, to mention specific moments in particular that are absolute highlights for me, I can do that now or we can, or we can wait. Why don't we come back for that? Okay. Um, I have a couple of things. Uh, I mean, it was fascinating you mentioned Billy Preston. And, um, it, it seemed like they were seriously considering asking Billy Preston to join the band. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you wonder why they just didn't, you know, say, hey, Billy, you, you know what, you want a permanent gig? Um, <laughs> uh, what well, I was Paul said, it's, it's hard enough with four. <laughs> right. Was they also, the, but before Billy joined the sessions, they were saying we need another Nikki Hawkins here. Right. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I wasn't sure about, um, did, was it total coincidence that they begin to talk about needing to be able to do this without overdubs? They need another player to handle the key, keyboards that talk Nikki Hopkins and the organ comes in and, oh, well, but Billy Preston just happens to be in the building and comes strolling in. Um, I don't, I don't know. Do we know if they knew Billy was around? Was it a complete coincidence yeah. no. that Billy happened to, co- to stroll in at a time when they were contemplating getting a fifth person uh, to play and Billy was available? You would think that Billy maybe had to be somewhere. It just seemed as though Billy was around and he was going to stay and, you know. He was there, he was there to film some uh, TV appearances, but he had been 
there, um, I think a couple of months earlier with Ray Charles and George saw him then. And George must have seen him again when he came back and said, you know, come to the sessions and you know, come by, say hello, whatever. And then they asked right. him, you know, to play. And uh, but, I mean, he does look surprised when they when they first say to him, you know, you you want to you know stick around and play on this, you know, and uh, so it's it's hard to say, but but the story's always been that George invited him. It um, sometimes I had to remind myself that this was the this movie, even at nearly eight hours in length, really was a sampler to the entire month um so there are conversations that may not have made uh uh peter jackson's cut where maybe the logistics of can billy stay billy can you stay oh i don't have anything scheduled for you know these these conversations may have happened and just weren't in the film mm -hmm. um uh or or were discussed perhaps uh you know when when no cameras were rolling or um, you know, there were there were times, though, I had to remind myself that you're not actually see, seeing a complete, you know, day. Uh, boy, how did they get to this song so fast or, you know, uh, so I had to keep reminding myself that um, for me, there was so, I found myself fascinated, I think, consistently over the time because it was the first time I've been a Beatles fan since I was four years old this is the first time that we're all actually getting to see this band work you don't we never really have been able to see them work there aren't 10 concert videos out there where you can see complete shows and um documentaries where you actually see them play a lot this was the first time you're seeing for the first time how they function as musicians how they play their instruments, hold their instruments, treat their instruments, um, what they were like as people. You know, we're seeing them for the first time as regular guys. Mm. Oh, wow. Did you see that? John scratched his nose just like I did. Franco. <laughs> you know, things like that. You, because, yes. you know what I, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. We yeah. had them at this point. For 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 our lot for our lifetime, we've looked at them in a certain way, and now here they are. I swear there was one scene where Paul belched, <laughs> and I think he did, and that's fine. Mm. He's a guy. He's a young guy. I know Alan belches all the time. No, I'm kidding, Alan. I'm just teasing. But you see, we see them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For the first time ever as regular guys, human beings, um, they're all in their late 20s. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're a little older than my daughter, you know, uh, and, and, and we're seeing them. And that, I think, was something that more times than not, I really was zeroing in on. Watching how they interact with other people in a casual way, like we would interact um, at Beetlefest, talking to each other just regular about regular stuff. Mm. Paul swinging around in the rafters or whatever, the scaffolding and whatnot, and twicking them. You know, um, uh, we're, we're horsing around there. You know, I kept thinking if he slips that hook that was at the end of that cable, we we're going to have a problem here. See, I mm. would slip and end up being impaled on that whole thing. Uh, but Paul is slinging around and it's like you're seeing them in this, you're, you're seeing four human beings. Uh, we've never seen that before. You get a little taste of what kind of dad Paul was, the way he was treating Heather. Um, mm -hmm. I got a kick out of the fact that of the four of them, and I have like a, a bit of a wicked sense of humor that sometimes I can't really share everything that enters my mind because I'd get committed. Um, but hearing, hearing John joke with Heather that you got to eat the cats, we can <laughs> eat cats. That I thought was hysterical because that's my kind of humor. And yeah, that fits the personality. But now for the first time, we're seeing that John Lennon's a goof. You know what I mean? Was firsthand. Uh, and, and that was really what was fascinating to me also. 
um, uh, one thing that kind of threw the entire time, the human part of the Beatles for mm. the first time ever. Uh, and then things like what you guys have pointed out, little instances like watching Paul sitting there, almost I felt like some f f f trying to vent a little frustration and comes out with get back. The way he was playing the bass, it just seemed like he was letting out some steam. There was aggressiveness to playing mm. the bass so hard. Next thing you know, he's muttering and the words and the melodies to get back is coming out. And I'm like, holy smoke, you see what's going on here? I have a when temper tantrum. I break things. Nothing comes of them. Paul is like <laughs> aggressively playing his bass. He comes out with one of the great rock songs ever. Um uh, I, I thought uh, I I have actually made a list and I don't know if maybe I should hold on to my list because uh, we're going to come back around and get uh, some some ideas, but um, some more ideas from each of us. Um, and I really, like I said, I wish I took better notes as we went along because there were so many little things that happened, uh, little scenes. I often got a kick out of hearing, especially in part three. And, and, and Peter Jackson was great about pointing out that what you're listening to now is what we hear on the album. This is it. This is the album version. And you're watching them going, you know, like we get back. I'm like, I've been, I had that single when I was four years old. And now I'm actually seeing how they, how physically, how it happened. Mm. You know, from when I was a little kid, these gods that were glowing had this aura, this aura about them in these long flowing golden robes were singing, get back. No, it wasn't like that. It's these four regular guys here. Um, and, and that was the big takeaway for me was uh, the human side of, of, of the four of them. And, and again, how they did were constantly coming up with something from nothing. Right. You know, these songs just out of nothing, you know, bah, 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 bah. and then next thing you know, somebody's, you know, Paul's plunking out chords to let it be. Um, I did feel, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed as though for a while there, they were struggling really to master one song. It seemed like it was going, uh, I've got a feeling one after 909. I've got a feeling one after 909. I've got a feeling, get back. One after 909, I've got a mm -hmm. feeling. And it seemed like they weren't really nailing it. And then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, here's the long and winding road. Here's Let It Be. George has old brown shoe. Um, and I don't know if that was the result of, of course, we couldn't see everything. But it seemed as though when the environment improved, the songs really just started popping. You know, um, and maybe they were a little less hesitant to let a song go to that they might have had in their back pocket, because then you start hearing Let It Be a lot more. And George, like you pointed out, uh, I forget who, who of the two of you pointed out, you know, Old Brown Shoe suddenly has popped up. Mm. You know, could George have been sitting on that and things weren't really going well and he just kept it under wraps? Because now all of a sudden, here's Old Brown Shoe popping up at the same time that we're hearing, um, you know, she came in through the bathroom window and John keeps going back to Polythene, Pam or mean Mr. Mustard. And hmm. it's just, you know, and if I'm foaming at the mouth, I apologize, but that's how my emotions were running at times watching this. Um, well, you know something, I, I just want to say, and I make this a point to say in, in all the, the shows that I do, that it was such a prolific time that month between the brand new songs they were coming up with from scratch. Um, they went back and did early Lennon McCartney songs. There were songs that they were writing that ended up on solo albums or ended up on Abbey Road or it never were released at all. Mm -hmm. Like Window Window, George Harrison, which is in the, mm -hmm. the All Things Must Pass box set. You had all those songs, plus of course the covers of 50s rock songs songs that are pre-rock and roll there's so much stuff there if you listen to all the nagra stuff and i haven't heard all of it but and these snatches of songs that aren't fully developed that could be developed later on it was especially from paul so many ideas were popping out of his head 
And it's just amazing, you know, when you think about it. I was um, floored when Paul just breaks into the back seat of my car. Uh huh. And another that day. That may have been like part three. That, that was a little later, further in. Uh, I, you, you know that so many of these songs are probably in their infancy stage that we listen to of the early solo stuff. Right. But kind of like, for, I wasn't thinking anything Ram was going to all of a sudden appear. And maybe mm. I did know that the back seat of my car was written and was existed in the later days of the Beatles, but I'd forgotten that. And when he starts singing the back seat of my car, it was like merging these two worlds. It's only a couple of years, but it's like these right. two worlds that I always take separately. Oh no, they're, they're together. Um, yeah. Also interesting that even though there was a lot of attention given to the song, all things must pass. We didn't really hear the other songs from all things must pass that George is working on during that time. Right. right. Like um, hear me Lord and let it down and that stuff. Well, uh, I'm going through some things and I actually have a couple of questions for the two of you. Uh, but I was uh, interested that no sooner did they begin playing in Twickenham and they looked enthusiastic at the beginning, the first day there seemed to be, some adrenaline going and they were happy to be playing together and that didn't last. And one of the first things that they're discussing from the beginning is they don't like the sound in Twickenham. Uh, they have an issue with it. That was almost immediately. And that seemed to be the first domino of maybe other dominoes that began to quickly come down within a few days and you start seeing the problems coming up. Now, I may be incorrect when I say this and I, and I know that um, from what I've read and everything that like the drug is, is a bitch heroin. Uh, we know that George, George, John was struggling with it. Uh, and I think that that as Alan, again, I forget who pointed that out. I think Alan, you did. Um, it really seems to me that John's in a bad place. And as a result of that, he's indulging because he is clearly mentally and physically not there. This isn't just a disinterest. This, he's not there. You know, he's not even making guttural <laughs> noises. Uh, he is checked out, but I think that a lot of that is chemically in, induced. Um, and that goes away when the monkey's off, you know, the, the pressure's off. Um, a little discipline. And it seems as though John has managed an issue that I'm sure was probably still in his life. You look like you want to say something, Alan. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I didn't really see him being out of it. And in fact, one day that we know that he was using heroin was uh, January 14th. Um, he gave an interview to the CBC, a, a TV interview, where he had to go to the to the men's room and throw up because he he just was you know still kind of strung out, um, and in fact you know as as that that interview traded among collectors, it was called the two junkies interview, you know John and Yoko, um, and yet that is the same day, and and it may be. I don't know how much time elapsed between that interview and this scene, but that's the same time he does the Baden Powell Boy Scouts thing. And there, you yeah. know, he's probably still high, but he is totally on top of his game. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard to tell. It's hard, it's, it's hard to tell what effect drugs had on him because, um, you know, I, I don't know that he was totally yeah. zoned out. But also, this is an interesting thing where I, I have a question for the two of you, you know, to see if you perceive it this way. But John has always said or said sometimes um, that the reason he was using heroin was because of um, everybody in the Beatles was so down on Yoko and making it hard for them. We don't see any of that. And mm. we don't see... Yoko being any kind of a problem. Um, but after the meeting at George's house, they come back and Ringo and Paul are there. This is the then there were two conversation. And what are they talking about? John and Yoko. 
and Paul saying, you know, it's going to be kind of comical in 50 years. People are going to say the Beatles broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. And Paul then does his whole thing about how, you know, this is, you know, this is what John is, John is in love. We have to, you know, be supportive. We just have to accept it and all that stuff. The impression that I got was he's having this conversation because one of the issues that George may have brought up is Yoko, you know, did, did you get that impression? I mean, you know, why are they talking about this now in the context of George having left, they had a meeting, George still isn't here. And what is the subject? They're talking about Yoko and whether people are going to say they broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. To me, that implies that George had an issue with Yoko. Presumably, you know, from what we can see, Paul doesn't. Ringo doesn't. That leaves George. So that seems to me why he's talking about it. But, you know, but who knows? I was just wondering if you... If Fascinating. You... I mean, that's one thing we'll never know because we didn't, we have no idea what that was discussed in that meeting that didn't go well, mm -hmm. as, as Peter put it in the, the caption. I got the impression Paul was kind of talking himself into believing. I got to let my friend go, mm. at least part of him, uh, because he's going to fall in love and he, he has fallen in love. And it, it, the day is going to come where he's not, you know, we're, we're not like, you know, teenage friends anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, it almost seemed like Paul was talking that into himself. Face it, Paul, face it, you know, when you having a something a conversation with yourself about it. Like I, I've got to like get used to this. This is how it is. This mm -hmm. is the real world. That's what I, my takeaway. Um, and, and, and it occurs to Paul that this might be it. It's over. And I don't know if he's thinking my career is going with it. I have no idea how they thought their future, where their futures were going, how intensely in, you know, they were getting. Um, I thought it was Ringo whose eyes were tearing up hmm. at that point, not Paul. Hmm. Uh, Cause I, I kept think, waiting for Paul to begin to break down. Didn't it look like he was gonna break down? And yet then it seemed as though Ringo was actually, but they also were then more matter of fact, and I was getting a little annoyed at Michael Lindsay Hogg, who seemingly would keep coming back to, so this performance that we're doing in five days, it's like, <laughs> hey, shut up with this performance. <laughs> My life is falling apart. Right. You know, um, but that's an interesting observation, Alan. I don't, I didn't, I don't know. We, we have to know what went wrong in that conversation at, uh, where did they meet at? Uh, Ringo's house. Ringo's house. Mm -hmm. so. But and I think that Paul, that, Paul that, was facing reality, I think, yeah. knowing yeah. that you have to deal with Yoko. Not only that, but unless you do accept this, he's going to leave. If he has a choice between the band and Yoko, he's going to pick Yoko. Mm -hmm. So if you want this band to continue for as long as they can, you got to deal with this, no yeah. matter what. Yeah, maybe George did have an issue. That's a good point. It's not spoken and we don't see it. Well, John, uh, in, the, um, in, in that Rolling Stone interview in, at the end of 70, um, talks about how, you know, George specifically was saying, you know, we've, we've heard bad stuff from New York about Yoko. She's got a bad reputation and, um, you know, and, and John was very incensed about that. And here it was like quite a bit later. Now we don't know if that, if George said these things, well, first of all, if he said these things, take John's word for it, um, because he's quite exercised about it. Um, but we don't know whether it was at that meeting, you know, we, we always hear of certain issues George had at that meeting, but Yoko is usually not mentioned. And yet here it is the next day there, Ringo and Paul are talking about it, or Paul is talking about it. So it, it just sort of seemed to me that maybe, maybe one of George's things is, and, you know, no more Yoko at the sessions and that well, wasn't going to go over. Well, what happened within an hour or so of of uh, George leaving? The free form jam with Yoko taking a mic. Right? Yeah, it was almost as if George ain't here. So, where where I'm sure it was a, a catharsis for the three of them now. Who oh, God knows what they're feeling. George has walked out, you know. So you know they're venting, aggressively playing, and 
George is gone. So Yoko could kind of loosen up a little bit and, you know, right. join the band for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's also that scene in part three where they're jamming with Yoko. Mm-hmm. And Heather is in there and she's banging on Ringo's drums and everything. She's even screaming like Yoko. Imitating you stole, Yoko. You stole, don't say any more. I'm coming back to that in a, in, a, in a little bit. Did you feel that George seemed at one point, maybe midway through the Apple sessions, the Apple studio sessions, where he was beginning to feel a little disconnected again? Like he seemed, really. there was a period there where it looked like just to look on his, because now I'm looking at their, uh, in their eyes now, mm. you know, this is the first time ever I can look up their nose and their ears. And uh, it seemed like there was a little bit of a, t- a period there where George was beginning to feel like the outsider again. Um, I don't know if either one of you picked that up. It may have been fleeting. Um uh, or yeah, I didn't just see that. Been, there was nothing to say at that given time and the camera happened to be on him, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but Can I just say something about this thing about John and his heroin use? I mean, I keep hearing about it over and over for years and especially on other podcasts and people talk about it like it's a fact. And yes, I know he was taking heroin, but we don't know how bad it was. Right. And yeah. how much did it really affect his work? Because even if you look at the whole year of 1969 between Let It Be and Abbey Road and the Plastic Ono Band singles, he still wrote quite a number of songs. He was still very active, you know? And when push came to shove during the Let It Be sessions, maybe he cleaned his act up for that short time, but he delivered. Yeah, He was solid during that time period. Sometimes I don't know if this whole thing about John's use of heroin is just overblown a bit. I'm not denying that he took it. I just don't know how strong an effect it really had on his work. Right. I agree with you. And he probably was has had a strong constitution because if if it's true that cold turkey is about heroin withdrawal, if jo- John kicked it that cut and dry, he did it cold turkey, it's not easy to do. So perhaps he was able to turn it on and off uh, you know, and when in, in bad times, he leaned a little more on the crutch and when times were better, there's less of a need to lean on it um, or more recreational. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I have no idea. And I don't want to like, you know, come off as being matter of fact about, you know, the addiction to, to heroin. But um I think it, it was a player. I agree with you, Ken. It was a player, but I don't know if it was that much of. Mm-hmm. I would tend to say no. It wasn't that much of a of an uh, of a, a weight around George, uh, John's neck. Um, okay. Let me throw some questions at the two of you. Um, what was the issue in part three when they were in the Apple Studio? All of a sudden, the PA became a problem. Uh, and George Martin was involved and it didn't seem to be something they were talking about yeah. up until this point. We're just a few days away from the rooftop performance. Because, because they're now recording and basically they had the PA, but the way they're sitting is, you know, the way they're sitting, you've got some of the mics pointed right at the PA, you know, with them in between, but still the, they're getting the sound from the PA in the mic. And so they say, well, you know, when we, we played in Hamburg or whatever, we had a PA and all that. And George Martin is saying, yes, but basically you were, your relationship and the microphone's relationship to the PA was different. Here, your microphones are going every which way and picking up all of the PA sound. And that's a problem in the, in the booth where they're recording because it's interfering. So once they got the green light to go ahead and start doing their thing in Apple, Glenn Johns was done setting everything up. They didn't start recording from that point. They did. That's why this becomes an issue then it didn't become an issue in Twickenham because you yeah. know, they only, by the time Glenn Johns was set up, they were pretty much. No, but no, but I mean that early on when they were first starting at Apple Yeah. and the equipment was all set, and Maybe they got, you know, they're waiting, they're waiting, and then they start. They were recording from that point on. They didn't right. complain about the PA for several days. Mm-hmm. 
almost as if something was changed in the setup in his studio uh, that final week. Maybe it was the way they were sitting that day, but the previous days it wasn't an issue, or or maybe it was an issue and and, and uh, okay, yeah, getting and that figured it entire out. day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the other question I had? Um, I learned a little something about um, George and his guitar. Uh, did George have his guitar running through a Leslie speaker the entire time or only occasionally? I think only occasionally. What do you think, Ken? I wasn't really paying that careful attention yeah. to that. Well, they bring the Leslie speaker in. And that was like the little detail because I'm like, oh, oh, great. That's the only other time I've, I've only seen the Leslie speaker in action, you know, concert clips with the various bands and Pink Floyd using it and uh, and now here's a Leslie speaker. And it was only when I guess they were doing Old Brown Shoe, that funky sound. Uh, I guess it was Old Brown Shoe or George George's guitar. I was like, ah, oh, so that's how they did it. He's got his guitar. And I'm wondering, I wonder if it was throughout all, you know, everything he was doing, George, if it was going through so. a Leslie. I don't think so. He does. He uses it on on the solo and let it be as well. And I'm not, I don't think we ever got to really see him play the solo and let it be. Maybe yeah. once. Um, Another interesting thing. How about when they're doing Old Brown Shoe? Uh, that uh, kind of um, tack piano effect. It was newspapers jammed in the in in the strings of the piano. Uh, that I found fascinating. Well, isn't uh, that for you, Blue? Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I, didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't write the song da titles down there. Yeah. But for you, Blue, I was like, wow, that's how they can achieve that. Just shoving newspapers in on mm. in between the strings to get that that uh, kind of tinny, of whatever, tinny effect. On the piano, um, yeah. Uh, let me um, go through. I got the, some 10 takeaways, and then we'll throw it back to Alan. Okay. And then to Ken. And get some more of your thoughts. I know you have a list, Ken. You said you want to share yeah. observations. They're, uh, they're probably no, not as neat as that. yours. <laughs> let's go to yours. Ken, let's do, do you first. Uh, your oh, list, as you mentioned. Of highlights? Yeah. Um, well, at first I thought I was going to talk about the first two parts, but part three blew me away for a few things. That jam session of I Want You, She's So Heavy where they're using the I have a dream words. Oh my God. <laughs> With Billy Preston, they are rocking. I mean, and Paul's playing the slide. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it was incredible to watch. I certainly wasn't expecting that. There's also that moment where, and Peter Jackson corrected me when we interviewed him about, I thought based on the Get Back book, when Paul was reading off a list of songs that I thought he meant they could do on the Apple rooftop, they were really songs that they were considering for the next album. And so they're doing Dig It. And then John is just reading off the titles, you know, jamming to Dig It, you know, with the Dig It background. I thought that was super cool to see that. Um, I mentioned Old Brown Shoe because they're just so alive in the studio and having fun with it. And there are those moments when Paul goes behind the drums or you see George behind the drums. I'm trying to remember where John, when John was, because John was also playing drums at some point. Um, but those are definite high points for me. I love those moments when it's just Paul at the piano and he's playing stuff like Martha, my dear, the piano part to that. Mm -hmm. And he's playing woman, you know, the song mm -hmm. that he gave to Peter and Gordon. Yep. You'll never hear Paul sing woman other than this. Yep. <laughs> Unless there's a demo somewhere that we haven't heard. And then he was I mean, explaining that... to someone about, and then he mentioned something about, he mentions Peter and blah, 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 Gordon did, and I'm like, that's right. Because I, I was slow to pick up that that was the woman that they gave to Peter and Gordon. And Paul's telling someone, possibly um, Michael Lindsay Hogg, but I could be wrong, about the song and how how they gave it or how it was, handled by Peter and Gordon. That was that was a good good observation. Yeah. And um, that moment when he's doing another day on the piano, that was really sweet. Just the very beginning of it, he had more to write of the song. But just knowing that these songs started this early, 
there's a lot of songs that that Paul wrote that they all wrote while there were still Beatles that ended up on solo albums. Yep. And so just to know that, um, you know, uh, certain things that were said in the sessions, that the fact that even though it's 1969, they still think like, you know, they bring up things that have to do with their history all the time. Mm -hmm. Like um, early on when, when Paul says that um, when they're discussing where they're going to play, Ringo says, we can't go abroad. Ringo doesn't want to go abroad. And then Paul says, I'm hoping Jimmy Nickel might go abroad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they yeah. bring up Jimmy Nickel later on um, at one of their shows in Sweden where he didn't start She Loves You because he was eyeing the girls. Right. You know, just the fact that these thoughts pop into their brains, everything goes back to their past and thinking about Hamburg and bringing up certain things. And just, you know, you notice, and um, if you're familiar with the Nagra tapes, um, there's so many Beatles songs that they only play for a few seconds. And then they slip that into this movie. And later on, I'm looking at the credits and, and I'm saying, where was I'll get you? I don't remember I'll get you yeah. here, you know? Yeah. But they go back, like Paul starts uh, doing Strawberry Fields Forever. Yeah, that was just, nice. you know, uh, you know, a short excerpt of it, just the very beginning of it. All that stuff I love a lot. I love all the 50s rockers that they were doing. I love some of the stuff that they were kind of making up on the spot. That song, I guess it's called Song of Love, which is really goofy from Paul, you know, mm -hmm. it's just for you. You know that one. And uh he just seems to have all these melodies in his brain and these ideas and, and they're coming out in droves, all these ideas from, from Paul. Um, but most of all, it has to do with observing the four of them and how they looked at each other. You know, what was their frame of mind on a certain day, how things changed. And, you know, I might've said this before, but the fact that Paul, this tremendous transformation from Paul, and I guess you could say from John, who got very serious once they went to Apple and he really took charge of everything. The fact that Paul was so much more relaxed once that happened. And even towards the end, he was the only one when they're talking about going on the rooftop. George said, I don't really want to go on the rooftop, but I'll go if you want to. But Paul said he didn't want to. You'd think he'd be the one that <laughs> would be the first one that to make a suggestion you know, or, or uh, for any idea for them to perform. But he was very concerned about the big payoff and all this. Like there has to be a big concert at the end. Um, and he wanted there to be an album of 14 songs and he wanted it to be a, a concert with 14 songs or a full album. And on the other hand, here's John, who's more realistic, saying that we've got five or six songs. Let's just leave it at that. So they already knew going into the Apple rooftop concert, they were only going to do five or six songs and they stuck to five. And for so long, I've been saying people are upset that that concert was stopped after 42 minutes. They probably weren't going to go beyond those five songs. Right. No. Did you get the impression that the idea, the way it was staged, the way it was set up, the idea for going on the roof was Glenn Johns and Michael Lindsay Hogg's idea? Um, because there was that, Paul would seem really down about how are we wrapping this? How are we coming, you know, how are we bringing this to a head? And they're talking and Paul seems to be getting more and more depressed. But then Glenn Johns and Michael Lindsay Hogg come over to Paul and, just, hmm. and Paul smiles mm -hmm. and we cut away and we've found, figured out a solution has been decided. They'll go on the roof. What's really interesting um, is there's, there's another discussion, I think a bit after that, between Paul and John, <clears throat> and they are completely in different places. For Paul, just doing a film of making an album and just making an album is basically the same old, same old. He wants mm. to do something else. That's why he wants there to be a concert at the end. And I think from his point of view, the rooftop isn't really enough. You know, it's only going to be the songs that can be done on the rooftop, which means no piano songs, no acoustic songs. And um, 
you know, he, he keeps sort of making the point that, you know, but this is then just a documentary of us making an album. And John says, well, you know, making albums is what we do. But Paul mm. wants it to be something else, the same as he wanted to do Magical Mystery Tour or the same as he wanted Pepper to be them making an album, but not as the Beatles, not as the Mop Tops being, you know, uh, inhabiting the persona of some fictitious band. You know, he just uh, seems to, you know, always want to do something a bit different than what they normally do. And John was okay with continuing doing what they normally do, especially under these circumstances which is where you don't have much choice. You know, Ringo's got to go start filming. Glenn Johns has to go to America to record um, uh, Steve Miller, I think. Um, and these sessions are coming to an end. It's, you know, if they had, I think, I think he says at some point, you know, if we had another three weeks, that would be mm. one thing, but we don't, you know, we, we have this, we have these songs, let's do them. You know, he's very practical, which which isn't what you would expect of John in a way. You yeah. would expect John to be the big fantasy guy and Paul to be the practical one. But oh. it turns out sort of opposite here. I, thought I also good. thought uh, George Harrison's comments at the time, he, he was basically saying, where is the effect of this is who we are. We're a band. And no matter what the problems are, everything works out in the end. <laughs> You know, everything's going to work out. It always has. It always will. Like, there's no, there's no cause for worry here. We're still going to put out a good album. You know, yeah. that's, that seems to be his attitude about it. Don't be so tense. Don't, don't uh, you know, Paul was feeling the pressure all along to, to have all these results within a month. Right. To piggyback off something you said, Ken, when you, these little instances that you, uh, that really stuck with you. How about when they were in the control room at Apple listening to a playback of Get Back and George goes, let's make this the next single. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and then on the screen, the Beatles have figured out what their next single will be. And Paul and George goes to Paul, what was our last single? Was, you know, <laughs> and they think for a split second and Paul goes, oh, hey, Jude. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. I'm sitting there going, Guys, I know the catalog number. You can't even remember what you put out a couple of months ago. Um, but you know that what you were saying about Get Back, this is probably the same session. This is another thing I found fascinating. George is talking about how this song, there's something in there that reminds him of Reach Out, I'll Be There from the Four Tops. And I'm trying to think yeah. in my brain, what is he hearing that I'm not hearing? Yeah, It doesn't really matter whether or not I'm hearing it. I don't think you know, he's saying but, it, it reminds him of it. I think he's saying that it needs a hook like yeah. the hook on Reach Out. And he's singing it. He's singing Reach Out with the chords to get back, you know, while they're playing Get Back because he thinks it needs that extra something. Right. You know that that guitar part that you hear in Get Back? It's the da 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 Is that what he's thinking of, maybe? I don't know. Where is that in Reach Out? No, I'm not saying it wasn't reach out, but maybe he's thinking it needs something like that in the backing mm, mm. of the song. But but you, it's just interesting when you hear George coming up with a suggestion like that and then paying attention to him. You know, I found that to be really fascinating. Mm. Do you, uh, Alan, do you have any like highlight points and whatnot that you haven't shared yet? Well, apart from the ones that I mentioned, um, there are things uh, I found particularly interesting that maybe no one else might might have, but that we talked about a little before, which is Dick James turning up. Mm. Um, he has bought a, catalog, a bit of the Warner catalog, it turned out, I think, um, for Northern Songs. Northern Songs was the company that... John and Paul owned part of with Dick James music. Um, I think George had shares at, at some point too, and, and probably Ringo, I can't remember. He's been through all this Northern Song stuff a lot, but um, it's complicated. Um, oh. But here, you know, he has acquired this catalog 
Paul is looking through the catalog and noticing certain songs that he knows one song is his uncle's favorite. And to me, um, that was really interesting because, uh, you know, he, when, when he bought the Buddy Holly catalog and it's talking about how, you know, uh, I needed to figure out what to do with my money. And my father-in-law, Lee Eastman was, you know, saying, what do you, what do you want to invest in and suggested music catalogs? And I thought that was a great idea. Well, this is interesting because here we have Dick James who, because of the, their, uh, the abrasiveness of their relationship with Dick James in the final years of the Beatles, Paul is not going to give Dick James credit for, for coming mm. up with an interesting idea. And yet here is Dick James buying a catalog that the Beatles will now own with their own stuff um, as part of Northern Songs but which has a bunch of old standards that Paul knows and likes and his family likes and all that. Um, mm. it, it's almost as if you can see the light bulb over his head going off, you know, because uh, that's what he ended up doing. I mean, he now owns quite a lot of publishing, you know, I'm not discounting uh, Lee Eastman's having, you know, also suggested it, you know, at a time when it was, you know, more practical for Paul personally to start buying catalogs. But it's not as if Paul had never thought of this before, because here we see him with Dick James uh, being shown a catalog that he basically bought. Um, so that was one although with the Eastman family, it went far beyond like standards, because oh, yeah. Paul ended up yeah. owning uh, a lot of show music like Annie. That's right. Yeah. You know, how to succeed in business. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. So the Dick James one, um, the one that Ken mentioned, the Billy uh, jam of, with I Want You and John and Billy yeah. sharing the vocals, you know, um, knowing that and having seen in the film that John was, you know, keen on inviting Billy to be a member of the Beatles, that I Want You kind of, you know, was making me think, okay, like, what if that happens, you know, it, like it opened up a whole world of what ifs, you know, and alternate universes, like, what if Billy joined the Beatles as a regular member, and they continued, you know, that, that version of I want you struck me as like, this is where it could have gone, you know, this mm. kind of thing, this kind of interaction of Beatles music and a, a more sort of, you know, soul oriented kind of music, soul jazz, um, cause that was Billy's background and, uh, and it fit together so perfectly, um, that, that was a really, I thought an exciting moment. Um, in fact, I thought given that, uh, you know, Billy gets like about three seconds of screen time in the rooftop concert, you mm. know, and which I, I thought was such a pity. Um, the rooftop concert, of course, uh, is, is a highlight. Um, I think that the way Peter Jackson handled that cinematically was absolutely brilliant because you've got three things going on. You've got the performance, you've got the people on the street, which, you know, on this show a few episodes ago, I had said, you know, I, I really am not interested in what people on the street have to say. And yet, Watching it this time, I was kind of fascinated by the fact that, you know, even though, you know, this was a new Beatles sound in a way, uh, they hadn't, they, they brought out an album just a few months earlier, but this wasn't any of that stuff. People on the street, you know, in most cases, when they said, do you know who that is? Yeah, it's the Beatles. One woman says, yeah, it's the Beatles, obviously. You know, <laughs> and someone says, and that's Paul McCartney singing. You know, I don't know that if the Beatles magically got together now and played on a rooftop somewhere, you could get, you know, that many people on the street to even know who it is. You know, right. I remember going to buy the Beatles anthology book at Barnes and Noble and asking the person behind the desk. And she said, um, is Beatles the last name of the author? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going on? Um, so, uh, no, so that, fuck. that was, that was interesting. You know, all these people, you know, down there this time it struck me as interesting and the cops, 
you know, that whole thing we got to see a lot more of than we see Mm -hmm. in Let It Be, where we just see them come in and then we see them on the roof. We don't see them trying to read the riot act to the people in the Apple lobby. And we don't see the degree to which the people working for Apple stalled them and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> shrugged their shoulders. It was and... getting funny. It was becoming like it wanted mm. to be a sitcom because it seemed like a different person would come up to the police and the police would have to go through the whole thing again. And then and the sergeant explain... comes. The sergeant comes and, and says, oh, they're up there, are they? <laughs> you know? The mm. other the other policeman. <laughs> So you've got these three things and he's balanced it, I think, really well, because, you know, it's a drama playing out. It, it really ups the tension on the rooftop concert because you're watching when it goes back to the performance, you're watching the performance and you know it's going to get shut down. I mean, you know, it's going to get shut down because you saw Let It Be. But nevertheless, there's there's even, I thought, more tension in, in mm-hmm. the way that scene was cut together. And, you know, that said... I really do hope, speaking as a music guy, that uh, when the Blu-ray comes out, there is a bonus section that is just the performance without Mm -hmm. all the other stuff. I I loved seeing it in the film, in the main film, but I'd love to see just the performance as well without those things too. Right. Well, my feelings are probably the opposite of yours there, Alan, but when it comes to the Blu-ray, I want the exact the exact opposite is I really wanted it to be strictly the Beatles and everybody on the, on the Apple rooftop and not the people on the street. And yes, it was so well done and all the split split screen effects. Fantastic. Seeing the cops enter the building, the tension, like you're saying, I think that was done well, but I'd rather see that on the Blu-ray but on the actual documentary, just the Beatles because You know, I want to see it completely uninterrupted, just them, different shots, all the different people that were on the Apple rooftop with them, all the different angles. You know, what's wrong with having just a pure concert and nothing else and nobody on the street talking over the music? The music should come first to me. And um, I thought we were definitely going to get that in the documentary. Still, the way that Peter Jackson did it was brilliant. No doubt about it. I think that should have been a bonus on the on the um, on the Blu-ray. I think his cut he did it, and he did it so well. There were brief cutaways. They were sometimes actually inserted in between songs. Mm-hmm. You know, so they were uh, were as unobtrusive as possible. Uh, but they were also different comments that were that we didn't see in the original movie that were that kept right. it kind of interesting. Um, I, and I, and and perhaps it can be done that way that it, that the rooftop concert will be taken apart. That you could actually even check out unreleased clips of the man in the street interviews uh, and hear more of them. Or, uh, boy, w- I'd love to see that whole like that whole however long it was in the lobby with the cops because I was waiting for somebody to come up and start showing the cops a car trick to distract them, you know, <laughs> to stall because knowing that. They only got one more song to do. I'll show them a car trick, uh, you know, because they seem to be wanting like they're getting little bits of information. Uh, mm. We'll go get Derek Taylor. Fifteen minutes go by. There's no Derek Taylor, uh, so that would be a fun thing to watch. That camera that was planted wherever that they actually even showed mm-hmm. a piece of furniture or something where their camera was in. It's in there, folks. Mm. I mean, that was just priceless stuff. Um, I made a list of 10 takeaways uh, from uh, having a little fun with the movie uh, that I'd like to share with everyone. Uh, In no particular order, number one, Mal Evans seemed like a great guy. And and I'd love to be Mal Evans' assistant. And how cool it would be to go run errands with Mal Evans because... You know, we know that they would that, that Mal w- was sent out to get women's ho- pantyhose to make the uh, windscreens for the mics. Who who knows what other things Mal was sent to take care of, and Mal would do it. And hanging out with Mal for a day would you know be something I would love to do. So rest in peace, Mal Evans. He 
he really um, uh, was one of my favorite parts, just him being uh, around. And did you know that he was six foot six? I looked that up. I knew he was a big guy. I didn't know he was uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo really need to, like, you know, wash the hair a little more often. The little, uh, there's lots of slick moments there with the, you know, hmm. it's like guys. Especially with Paul. Yeah. Um, George was a great dresser. I give him points over the other three george had some dynamite outfits mm -hmm. and you know that i'm thinking to myself you know if i was hip and i was around in 69 i'd want to wear blue ruffles and uh uh some great psychedelic uh and those shoes yeah those psychedelic boots mm. off the charts george was the dresser um how on earth did John, Paul, George, and Ringo get away with parking their cars right in front of Apple? Well, we saw one of them or two of them get a They're ticket. They're getting a ticket, right. <laughs> I, you know, but every every time they'd arrive in their car, they park. I, we've all been to Savile Row, right? You can't park on Savile Row. Right. But you can if you're a Beatle. And George and John, George and um, John and Yoko pulling up in the Rolls Royce, mm. leaving right there. I'm thinking somebody, uh, I'm thinking Mal Evans is probably sent out with the keys to go park it somewhere. <laughs> well, where do you park? There's not garages like today. Anyway, this is how this That's, tour is. It's a little yeah. damaged. Folks. I think you think too much, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After schlepping all the instruments, tables, amps, cameras, lights, wood boards, uh, scaffolding up to the roof, which I'm sure was mostly Mal again, what if Paul decided not to perform? You know, can you see it now? Mal going downstairs and going, I broke my ass hauling all of that stuff up to the roof. Now you get up there and make use of all this because they had some elaborate setup, but yet we're led to believe that even uh, right before the performance, it could have fallen apart. And they yeah. got all that stuff back down yeah. the narrow stairwell. I like when each of the Beatles, except Paul, is looking over the ledge. Yes. I actually have a bit of a fear of heights. That bothered yeah. me a little bit. I kind of like was flinching. And I brought this up, I think, in a sh two shows ago about how there's no railings or anything on British rooftops. It was well, take one step and you're going down. And how about <laughs> this isn't in my notes, but how funny was it when they were on the roof to get him up to the to the higher mm. landing? And they're pulling him and they're dragging him and he's in a suit. Um, anyway, uh, another observation of mine, this is a, a serious one. John Lennon's guitar playing, I was really impressed with Lennon's guitar playing. And it really did seem like there was as much, as much lead coming from John as it was from George. Uh, you know, I was really impressed with, it's really the first time we get to see healthy doses of John playing guitar. Hmm. And um, I was very impressed at that. And then another observation is toast. What kind of snack is toast? Can you, can you imagine like working all day long and say, bring you, okay, toast time. <laughs> what? And now that would be, now that they're all, the Beatles all within are in good shape. This would be my problem because I'd be raiding the Apple Studios uh, vending machine for the chocolate donut packages. All they had was toast and it got cold. And yet there's John munching away on a piece of toast that's been sitting there all day. If it happened today, you know, there would be Dunkin' Donuts boxes all over Apple Studios and boxes of coffee, cup of, what do they call it, box to Joe? Keep yep. in mind that at Apple, at Three Savile Row, they had a kitchen and a Cordon Bleu chef. So And yet all they're getting is toast and, yeah. and jam, right? It might be um, magnificent toast. <laughs> maybe it's apple jam. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> Glenn Johns was the coolest hipster because every once in a while, Glenn Johns would be dressed in this outrageous outfit, you know, <laughs> including the last days at Twickenham when he's in his booth, this is his studio that he finally has built. And we don't discuss that. He builds the studio only to break it down and leave. Yeah. Right. But Glenn Johns has these huge, cool sunglasses on that if I wore them today, 
you know, I'd, I'd be laughed out of the WFUV studios. But he, I mean, very cool, big hipster Glenn Johns. Um, then we have, uh, this was, well, it's the time. Boy, did they smoke a lot. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, finally, Heather McCartney was adorable. Uh, she just turned six. Uh, and I'm watching her. And you could see what a great dad McCartney um, probably was. And what a relaxed mom Linda was. But I'm watching Heather. And I'm thinking to myself, my mother would never let me behave like that. You know, rolling around on the floor. Um, you know, talking over the adults, telling Glenn Johns that we're going to get married one day. Uh, I could, I'm picturing my mom taking me aside, reading me the riot act about how I act with adults. Hmm. Um, and a couple of really cute moments were Heather doing her best Yoko Ono impersonation, which we mentioned earlier on, you know, Heather was dead on. <laughs> And, and John was even, there was even a vibe I was getting where they were looking at Heather going, wow. And there was also a scene where she was playing drums with Ringo and I'd be damned. She was keeping time flawlessly with Ringo. That's true. You know, she was playing maybe just a hi-hat or something, but they were, they were locked in. And I thought, what would happen if a six-year-old girl joined the Beatles as second drummer? Um I looked up one thing. This has nothing to do with anything, but um, what we don't realize and maybe was not known, I'm wondering if Linda was pregnant. Yeah. I yeah. thought it was a big revelation. And, you know, and you, Linda was <laughs> pregnant. Uh, and I'm wondering how, who knew how many, if anyone knew at the time, because uh, Mary was born in August. Right. So, you know, this, uh, she was, uh, you know, in the very early stages of pregnancy, which I found fascinating. Uh, you know, again, real life into, you know, intertwining with this, this world that I've been following for so many years. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's, 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 that's really all I got. You want more? A lot of, <laughs> a lot of observations there, Darren. Yeah. You know, I just want to bounce off of something that um, I think you were talking about, Darren, with uh, whether or not Billy could have been a fifth member or, or, or Alan, you might have been saying that. But at some point when they're having conversations during this this month, John is saying words to the effect. I'm not I don't know word for word, but, you know, the Beatles don't have to necessarily be just the four of us. Mm -hmm. So he's already thinking like a plastic on old band kind of concept where members can drift in and out. Maybe he was thinking about Yoko being a member. I don't know. But, you know, when you have complete freedom like that, maybe he thought, yeah, fine. What's wrong with having Billy Preston as a member mm -hmm. or Yoko as a member? Yeah. So, yeah. And um, I did note here, I was questioning before, George played drums on Susie Parker. That's cool to see. Yeah, the others play drums. You know, I also wanted to mention uh, one thing that I found really cool was when Paul's playing um, "Carry That Weight" on the piano, and he's got these verses that never end up getting used at all in the song, which is really interesting. And yeah. he's saying that you know this is for Ringo. I think he says that in yeah. the film, which is interesting in itself because when you listen to the Beatles recording of Carry That Weight, the way it's mixed, you hear Ringo more than the others. Mm -hmm. Kind of like flying in that way. Mm. I thought it was so, interesting to turn around. Uh, we, um, we, uh, I think Alan alluded to it earlier, the turnaround here. We're, um, when this whole thing starts, we're less than a month and a half removed from the White Album coming out. The White Album is brand new. There are Beatles fans who haven't even had a chance to buy it yet. And here they are, you know, the beginning of January 69, already in the beginning stages of the next project. And yet, other than occasionally, like Paul breaking into Martha, my dear, a uh, little brief musical snippets, there was no White Album talk. This thing is fresh in stores. Mm -hmm. And that same month, the Yellow Submarine album, I know you, the Yellow Submarine album is a, kind of a footnote in the discography. 
But at some point during these sessions is the day Yellow Submarine hits stores. And you would think there would maybe have been somebody saying this, you know, uh, it's in stores today, guys. And, and that maybe that would be it. But, hmm. um, you know, that was a January 1969 release. And just another little thing. There wasn't a lot of discussion. Again, this could have been stuff that didn't make Peter's cut. Right. No mention uh, of really any of the Apple artists except Mary Hopkins album cover, the design for postcard being shown mm. briefly. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, upstairs, for all we know, James Taylor's doing business, you know, somebody signing a contract. Um, you know, so none of that uh, making the film, I thought was kind of interesting. These other important parts of their they are uh, their lives not coming not coming through. And the funny thing is that um, actually this whole thing started as an idea to do a concert to promote the White Album. So it would have been White Album stuff. And then it gradually morphed into, well, why don't we just do a new album and a TV yeah. special, you know, uh, leading to. But who, who made that decision, though? Was that Paul that made that decision? Yeah. I, I think it, I think, you know, they had, they had all agreed to play these concerts. There's uh, there's, there's, uh, there are quotes from George in some of the British music papers talking about how, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do some concerts at the Roundhouse to, you know, which would mm. promote the White Album. I think that, you know, my impression has always been, and who knows if perhaps Peter puts out the, complete 56 hour version at some point uh, we'll know. But uh, my impression's always been that it morphed basically uh, in Paul's imagination, but they have to have all agreed to hire Michael Lindsay Hogg. And, you know, the, the, the whole idea as well was that, you know, they had, done, they had filmed Hey Jude at Twickenham and they liked the this this idea of you know the audience coming up and singing with them playing to an audience and that was probably how it ended up at twickenham in the first place and why it was going to be a concert with new stuff in the second place you know it just sort of like let's let's extend what we did with that hey jude thing that hey jude promo clip which was directed as well by michael lindsey hogg Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can see it all sort of coming together, but it, it, it isn't always apparent that it came together that way, but mm -hmm. it all makes sense, you know, once right. you sort of put the pieces together. I think, I think as we watch it, and I hope that I, do we have any idea how long Disney Plus will leave it up there for us to watch? Is it going to be a long-term thing? We don't know. I haven't heard. Because, you know, I, it's the kind of thing, if it stays there for a little bit, uh, I even think well, what we've seen, there will be other things that will unveil, you know, we'll be able to peel different parts of the onion and find things that maybe we haven't picked up on yet, even with one or two viewings. Yeah. Um, it, uh, you know, I, I kept trying to compare it, although they're kind of two different things, Thanksgiving, mid nineties, the Beatles anthology and Thanksgiving, 2021, the Beatles get back, which was a bigger deal. And it's so hard. And I kept thinking, yeah, but the anthology had two new songs. Yeah. It was also on network exactly. television, which everybody had. Yeah. So I was trying to think which one. I'll stop doing this now, folks. I I apologize for these things. I look at my. I'm looking at Ken. I'm looking at Alan. I look at me, and I'm going like this. You're just influenced by the juggling scene in the Get Back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're the uh, MPL guy. <laughs> the logo for MPL. Yeah, that's. Um, anyway, uh, I, final thoughts. I. I mean, I. You, the only final thought I have is, you know, you know. I would love to have run up behind Michael Lindsay Hogg and messed up his hair when he wasn't paying attention. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, I think I shared all my thoughts. Um, uh, do you guys have any closing? Uh... I have a few. I found it kind of interesting that if you listen to the Nagra tapes early on, Yoko does a lot of talking when it comes to discussing plans for the concert, you know, and you never see any of that 
in this documentary. There isn't that much of Yoko talking. She's by John's side throughout the whole thing. So she's very obtrusive. So, you know, she was somewhat involved in the conversations early on, Mm -hmm. but you wouldn't know that from this Mm -hmm. film. Um, Maybe that wasn't interesting to the storyline. I don't know. Um, And also, there's always going to be holes to fill in telling the Beatles story. And when we had Peter on, I asked the question, do you get to the bottom of why George left? And yeah, you can use that conversation that John and Paul had in the cafeteria and the fact that John and Paul and especially Paul weren't paying attention to George and showing some respect for him and kind of ignoring him. But then Peter also said, and it's not covered in the documentary, that George might have had some problems at home with Patty. And then we also talked to Peter because it's very important to Peter to bring this out in his interviews um, that there was all this talk about George and John having an argument that day and then George left. And Peter denies it and Peter talked to Olivia about it and Olivia knew nothing about it. And I'm not saying that this is inaccurate because we have to have proof whether or not there was any kind of an argument. And by no means would I even suggest that there was anything physical that happened between George and John. They could have had a meeting behind closed doors and something was said at the time and that could have contributed to George leaving. I don't know, is it even possible that Olivia doesn't know? Yeah. You know? Um, did Peter ask Yoko about it? Did Peter ask Paul and Ringo about it? You know, they even cover this in the documentary where they're reading reports and denying it about George and John, you know, having an argument at the time. So that's proof right there from the two of them that it's not true. But yet I keep hearing this all the time. Mm -hmm podcast shows, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just wish that we can prove that that never happened. You know? Mm. Yeah, good point. So the day um, that he leaves, um, just before that happens, just before they break for lunch and he gets up and says, I'm leaving the band now. um, They have that rehearsal of Get Back where Paul is saying, you know, basically where you're doing the emphasis on your chords, it's blocking my vocals and so it was another instance of you know being told how to play and um maybe that sort of added to other frustrations that were going on um because also the lunch conversation was about paul telling people how to play you know and Mm -hmm. uh, so that that could have been part of it i mean that's that's in terms of what we actually see that's as close as it comes because you look at George's face during that whole period and he's he's clearly brooding you know I I mean mean, Peter did tell us because I think I asked him um is there any lead in to the point that George leaves and Peter said nothing but you could see in his face Mm -hmm. uh that there's something wrong so while I'm watching the film I can tell it's John and John and Paul, John and Paul, John and Paul, and George is just sitting there and that look, it's like, you know, I was telling my family was watching it with me at that point. I said, George is about to leave the band. And he did. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, I'm just saying, you know, you just said you felt it coming, you know? Yeah. Well, there's always going to be some things that remain unanswered even with having a documentary that's almost eight hours long. Right. And we might get more of that in a DVD Blu-ray. So um, there's always going to be those mysteries still. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly want to believe that this is the way it was. And if there's any other reason that that George left, I'd certainly want to know. And if there's anything that happened in his his personal life with Patty, they're not going to talk about that in the documentary. So, yeah. But this is this was an amazing thing to watch. It's 
Who'd Maybe. have ever thought, you know, again, you made the point here, Darren, we've never actually seen, aside from Let It Be, the Beatles in a studio working on songs together, working out the arrangements from start to finish. How beautiful is it to watch Get Back as it's just starting to be written? Yep. And then you see the finished product. That's, it's riveting to see all that. Um, all these songs to know, I, I, I like to bring up um, how they rehearsed Don't Let, but Don't Let Me Down. And Paul is in there making suggestions. He has these ideas in his head and it's not working out, but I love hearing when they come up with ideas that they don't use, you know, mm -hmm. which is part of the whole process in studying this music, um, which the Beatles anthology did very well. Right. And, um, and bootlegs will show you. Mm -hmm. Really quick, I just thought of something. You, tri you triggered a thought in my head. I did not understand the day, I don't remember what day it was, but why they were talking so much about the trip to India and about films. Um, that seemed a little out of left field and I thought maybe one of the two of you might be able to put into context exactly. It was almost like the, I almost got the impression independent of each other, John and Paul both pulled out their home movies at the same time. And we were talking the next day about what was on these films. Um, could, do you guys have any I thoughts think, on why all of a sudden India, they were talking about a lot about? Mm -hmm. mm. I, thought, I don't know. I, I have to watch it again, but. Did, did John have films too that, that he mentioned? I, I, I thought it I was think Paul. He, did, he was talking like he'd seen something and Paul, I'm assuming that he, I don't know if Paul shot his own home videos. He did. Yeah. Uh, so John he was, was talking, talking about, about watching them. John was saying that he had films because Paul had said that he was going to make a film about going to India. So there were certain things like when John was in the helicopter that he would shoot as well. Um, but I think basically it was just that Paul happened to pull out his films that night and came in the next day in the studio and said, hey, I watched these films. Um, what I found a little more puzzling in there is that why are, you know, all these people are identified and a few aren't, one of whom is Donovan. Donovan right. is identified. <laughs> yeah. Or those little captions yeah. uh, that the the, Donovan didn't get one. Yeah. You know, what I thought was kind of awkward was Peter Sellers, the bit with him. <laughs> I mean, I know that they had to show yeah. it because he's part of the Magic Christian, but I didn't understand what they were saying to each other with John saying, you know, something about here's number three or here's number five. What, what was that been, a reference? It might've been a goons uh, reference to the goons. You know, it might've been something Peter Sellers did in the goons that John was referring to. I, I don't really know. Okay. Don't know the goons stuff well enough. I should know. I don't know if they had known how well they knew each other, if at all. Hmm. Uh, but I just got the impression Peter Sellers was there for business. And the Beatles mm. were there, and Ringo mainly, who he's going to be working with, and he just kind of, kind of awkwardly, strolled in to say hello, and uh, I couldn't tell whether or not they actually already had somewhat of a, a, a casual relationship, or they knew all knew each other. But I then felt, you know, this looks like Peter Sellers was there probably for something, um, in advance of the movie stopping yeah. by to say hi to Ringo and they were all, you know, there with the cameras rolling. Because mm -hmm. Peter Sellers did look a little awkward, like he didn't know what to say. What to say to these guys yeah. and he was out of his element. Yeah. Yeah. I expect him to go into the Inspector Clouseau voice though, then right in the middle of it. Is that your dog? Uh anyway. <laughs> uh I guess uh are we uh are our brains empty? I know mine's been empty for several months now. Because uh, we uh, could begin to put a wrap. But let me say this, though, maybe get a little ahead of myself. We're recording this edition of Things We Said Today on what is the 20th anniversary of George Harrison's death, November 29th. It's also the anniversary of my dad died. My father passed away two years after George on the same day. Uh, interestingly enough, not to get morbid, they were doing a story on like one of these news magazine kind of um, um, celebrity you know, 730 shows that are on primetime TV. And they had a story on Paul and I think it was Heather Mills 
uh, that was going to close out the show. And uh, I was in the hospital room with my dad and my mom and wanting, waiting to see what the story was. And as soon as they ended it, they wrapped the show, the credits rolled and my dad passed away. Almost, and I laughed. I said, you're good. Thanks. You waited for the McCartney story to end, <laughs> you know, because uh, I could just see him joking with me. Sure. It's all about Paul McCartney all the time. But anyway, uh, November 29th, 20 years ago today, my uh, <laughs> George Harrison passed away and we will do a George centric show uh, the next time we get together here on things we said today. So uh, that is ahead. Um, any more than that, they haven't told me, Alan or Ken. Uh, they said to me, I need to know basis only, Darren, shut up. And of course, if you haven't done so yet, be sure to go back to our last show. And uh, we were going to try to make the interview, let me be honest with you, close to eight hours long, like the movie. Uh, no, that was a complete, no. The length of that interview going almost four hours completely, that's just how it happened. And if you haven't had a chance to uh, watch all or any of it or listen to all or any of it, it's sitting there uh, and go back and use it as a reference point too. If you're watching the movie again in the future uh, through the holidays and uh, perhaps you want to go back and pick around and see, uh, you know, you know what I'm getting at. Listen to it again if you want. Can uh, I just say I, thank you to everyone for their comments who have watched this? You know, it means so much to us that you watched the show and you enjoyed it. And we, let's face it, we are so lucky that we had Peter. Oh, yeah. It isn't just the fact that it's Peter. He wanted to talk Beatles, really anything Beatles. Of course, everything turned into being about Get Back. But he was so generous with his time. And even though it was close to four hours we spent with him, if we had more questions, I'll bet you he would have. Oh, yeah, we. And I think it's a fairly safe bet. I can say this. Peter will be back at some point. And it probably won't be all that long from now because he, you know, and we maybe even could bring Peter into things that have nothing to do with Get Back. Just Peter Jackson Academy Award winning director and Beatle fan, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we're here to talk about whatever, you know, so that I'm sure that that'll happen. But um, uh, I can't and, wait for that. I can't yeah. Wait for that. Let's put a wrap. No, no and, and go around the horn and uh, share your info. And we will start with Alan. Okay. You can reach me through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can reach all of us um, by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed at things we said fab and um, two Facebook pages, uh, things we said today and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. That's how to get us. And let me just piggyback off that. Uh, I'm probably going to be, uh, let everyone know this now, I'm probably going to be starting a third Things We Said Today page that's going to concentrate mainly on get back stuff, but with the hopes of possibly making that our one central location. But we'll talk more about that in the time that comes. And the way I move, you know, it'll be 2026 and there still won't be, there won't even be a Facebook anymore. Uh, you're up, Ken. Okay. Uh, I've been pretty busy on my YouTube channel, which is called Ken Michaels Radio. And since we've been talking about Get Back, there is a guy that I've interviewed twice now in the last few months, Kevin Harrington. And he's all over these three parts. He only says one line in the whole thing. <laughs> but if you want to hear him talk, uh, we talked about his entire history, how he, he began working at NEMS um, as, as an assistant for Brian. And uh, later, he worked for Tony Bramwell at the Savile Theater. And he eventually became a, what he called a studio roadie, working with Mal Evans. And we, we talked all about that. And um, the second interview, which I just did a few weeks ago with him, started off being mainly about Mal Evans and Neil Aspinall, a little bit about Alan Klein and the Beatle breakup and what in his opinion was the biggest reason for the breakup. And then after he worked with the Beatles, his life was as a roadie and as a stage manager. 
And I have noticed ever since um, our interview with Peter Jackson and lots of people discovering our show, they know about these interviews with, with Kevin Harrington and I'm getting so many more views for that. So thank you very much. You wanna hear this guy talk? And talk about what it was like to work for the Beatles and being on the Apple rooftop. He was the guy that held the lyrics for John for Dig a Pony. Uh, yeah, there's two interviews on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. There's also a new interview that I did with Ken Womack and Jason Krupa. They were on our show talking about um, All Things Must Pass Away, their new book about the relationship between George and Eric. Most of the questions that I asked him were questions that I did not ask in our interview here on things we said today. Oh, and, were you keeping uh, the good stuff for yourself? I always save other questions. You know, we, we did um, an interview with Ken and Jason here. We also did one on my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. But I always made sure that there were some extra ones in case I could interview them on my own. Sure. So most of what you're going to hear in that interview, so that it's not just you know, rehash of the same old stuff. So that's on my YouTube channel. I also did a recent interview with Mark Lapidos, the founder of the Fest for Beatles fans, talking about the very beginnings of the fest and um, some of the special guests that he's had there through the years, like Billy Preston and Harry Nelson. My other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Um, we just did a show. We actually did two shows on Get Back. I was in the second one. The first one was on parts one and two. I was on part three, but we still covered the whole thing anyway. Um, and that was really great. John Montagna was a special guest on that show. He's been on our show. He's been on my YouTube channel. He's a bass player. He was with the Alan Parsons Project for seven years touring with Alan. And he discussed Get Back With Us from the perspective of a professional musician, what it's like to be in a band, he also studies psychology. He's studying that right now in school. So you add all that into the fold and he has you know, a, you know, somewhat of a fuller view of what it's like to be in a band in a situation like that with four very different people at this particular time in their careers. So um, that was a really great show. And we're also gonna be doing a tribute to George Harrison on the next show, which will be next Monday, which should be uh, December the 6th at nine o'clock. And that goes out live. It goes out live now on YouTube. It was going out on our Facebook page. We now are going out on our YouTube channel at nine o'clock. So if you can check that out, a few more things. My website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. There is Beatles trivia there every single week where you can win one of 10 great prizes, books, CDs, DVDs, vinyl all kinds of Beatles trivia. One person wins every single week. And uh, check that out, the Beatles trivia and games page. And there is one page that I devote towards my radio program that I've been doing for almost 40 years on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, which is syndicated now on 50 radio stations. There's a listing there for Every Little Thing of all the radio stations that carry it, their broadcast times with links to their websites so you can stream it. It's not a show that you can listen to on demand you have to listen to it as it's going out live but it runs every single day of the week somewhere in the world and uh you can find that all the radio stations on that page every little thing is the name of that show so uh yeah that's about it back to you darren all right thank you ken and i'll be checking out some of those things on your youtube channel and ken asked me a while ago if I'd be on it and I said yes and just we never hammered out anything which is my fault but uh, one of these days I will pop up there and sh I'll, I'll save some of my bad jokes and goofy comments like messing Michael Lindsay Hogg's hair up coming up from behind him and you know save it all uh, for me anyway uh thank you so much everyone for uh the kind words about the last show with Peter Jackson and for spending time with us there and here uh, for Alan Cozen and, and Ken Michaels, I'm Darren DeVivo. Oh, I didn't say my, uh, well, you know, I'm a WFUV. I didn't do my final 
uh, close out. Look for me on Facebook. Listen to me on WFUV. And, uh, and, and we'll be back with you uh, probably in a couple of weeks uh, here on Things We Said Today. Again, big thanks and see you soon.